baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. 6, 3 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Alright, we're going to talk about Satan. And everyone just went, oh ha! Yeah. <laughs> so, Satan. The first time we read about Satan is in Genesis chapter 3. But before we get into what form Satan came in, why are we even talking about Satan to begin with? Well, to be honest with you, there's a lot of misnomers about the devil, about who he is, what was his role in heaven, and why he fell and when he fell. Mm -hmm. So we're going to address those things. All right, so we first read about Satan or form of Satan in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1, where Eve got just a little bit too close to the tree that she was supposed to be staying away from. Yeah, the whole world, and she's right there. Yeah, yeah, she's got the whole <laughs> she's the whole Garden of Eden, and she's got to go right to the tree that she's not supposed to take part of. And we know that Satan appeared to her in the form of a serpent. And this is, this is what Genesis 3.1 says. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And if you continue to read this verse, you know that Satan tricks her. Yeah. Uh, causes doubt in her mind, and she ends up disobeying the one rule, that one, God one gave commandment, her, the one commandment that I, God I'd gave like her. Life would just be one commandment. Yeah, and then <laughs> that'd be easy. And then she gives the fruit to Adam, and Adam sins as well. And this ushers in uh, sin into the world. It ushers in death as well. So we know that we know that Satan comes in the form of serpent here in Genesis. And then if we move to the New Testament, uh, we have some verses of Scripture that refer to Satan, and even. Uh, tell you about him a little bit. Okay, here are some verses that the New Testament uh, uses to refer to who he is. It says in Ephesians 2.2, 2, it calls him the prince of the power of the air. John 12.31 calls him the ruler of this world. 2 Timothy 2.26 calls him the devil. 1 John 5.19, it says the world is in bondage, so he's the bringer of bondage. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 refers to him as the god of this world. John 8.44 refers to him as the father of lies. Revelation 12, 9 and 20, verse 2, calls him Satan or the dragon or the ancient serpent. Matthew 4, 3, he's known as the tempter. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and this, this, is, this one's very important. We're going to refer back to this. It actually refers to him as the angel of light, which what, is interesting. Yeah, well, so why, why is it referred to as... An angel of light. Well, the verse says that he will actually transform himself into an angel of light. So he doesn't show up with pitchfork, pointed ears, and all, all right. that stuff. He try he everything he does to try to get you to do something bad. He makes it look good. So he makes himself look good because he's an angel. Mm -hmm. and so he can make himself look like an angel of light. And you, and you hear evangelists and missionaries, and they'll they'll say that the devil is nothing more than an imitator. He likes yeah. to imitate what God does, but you know, in an opposite effect. Right. He doesn't have any real influence of his own. He can just, all he can do is imitate. Right. And I, I feel like sometimes we give the devil way too much credit. Oh, certainly. You know, and, and we know that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he conquered death. Mm -hmm. And that was what the devil had to make people afraid, right? They, yeah. He had death. And when, when, when Jesus took death from Satan, that sting was gone. Yeah. You know, but, you know, sometimes we give him too much credit. And he's, he's known by some names. Uh, he's known by... Uh, Abaddon. I'm, I'm is, glad you're going to be reading all these. Yeah, I know. I'm going <laughs> to completely <laughs> crucify all of these names. It means destruction. Apollyon means uh, destroyer. Beelzebub. We've all ho heard that uh, name before. There's uh, Beelzebul, I'm going to say. <laughs> Belial. Right, we'll go with that. <laughs> and then here's the here's a name I can uh, you can do this one. Enunciate. It's going to be Lucifer. That's the name. And so if we if we go back to the Old Testament now. After Genesis, after that account, we really don't hear much about Satan. Yeah, there's only a couple of accounts. Right, until we get to the major prophet Ezekiel, chapter 28. And so the prophet Ezekiel is uh, is going to pronounce judgment on the prince of Tyre. 
Yeah. All right. And so obviously this prince is, is dealing harshly with, with Israel. And so Ezekiel's had it. God's told Ezekiel to pronounce judgment on the prince of Tyre. And so he ends up starting off in verse 1 of chapter 28. He says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Thus says the Lord God. So now uh, Ezekiel is going to say some things to this prince. He, he says, Your heart is proud. You're a very prideful man. And, you know, God hates the proud pride in the heart. And so then he goes on, uh, you said, I am a God. So this prince of Tyree is basically claiming to be a God, which is kind of a common theme back there yeah. for cultures. That's part for of the people course who are or royalty, um, if you will. They consider themselves deity. Uh, Ezekiel says, yet you are but a man and you are no God. And then he says, you have made wealth for yourself, probably at the expense of the Israelites. And then he says, uh, great wisdom is in your trade. Um, then Ezekiel starts to pronounce judgment on the prince. And this is where it gets a little <laughs> bit weird. About halfway through the yeah, judgment. It takes a little turn. You're like, wait, what? Ezekiel, what exactly Seriously? are you saying? And so what does he say in, in chapter 28, verses 12, starting at verse 12? Well, notice the, how it changes. He, first he says, you are, and now it says, you were. Uh -oh. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in, in beauty. You were in Eden. <laughs> The Garden of God. Okay, so let's stop. <laughs> Wait right a there. minute now. <laughs> so uh, obviously he's not talking about the man prince anymore. Clearly, otherwise he'd be thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. And Eden at this point is <laughs> long gone. I mean, we know that there was only the, no one was really in Eden except for Adam, Eve, uh, the serpent, and God. That's it. So now he's obviously not talking about the man, the human being. Uh, prince of Tyree, yeah. but who who do you think he's talking to? Well, he's obviously talking about Satan or Lucifer or whatever whatever name you want to use. Probably has quite an influence over this over this king, right? So this king or this prince might even be demonically, yeah, he um, could have possessed influence him. or possessed at yeah. this time. So he's talking about the power that's behind the, yes. the spiritual that's warfare really that's a great behind way to put it. the prince of, of Tyree. Yeah, the and power so, that's behind it. That's and then good. so he continues uh, after the uh, being in. The, the garden of God, he continues. It says, every precious stone was your covering. It says, you were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness or iniquity was found in you. You were an anointed guardian cherub. Well, that right there tells you it's not a man. Yes, right. <laughs> I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God. So what, what do you think the holy mountain refers to? Well, I don't know that it's, it's probably not Mount Sinai. It probably has something to do with heaven. It could be Mount Sinai, I'm not saying for sure, but I, I would lean more that it's probably representative of something in heaven. And by the way, what Matt and I are talking about, there are a couple different theories out there about yeah. who Satan is, what he was doing. I've heard evangelists say he was nothing more than just a choir director in heaven. <laughs> and, and it's not much to yeah, go on And sometimes that. you're like, really? It doesn't say anything like that in the Bible. Right. It never says that he led the worship. So I'm not saying what Matt <laughs> and I are saying is 100% correct and it's objective truth. There are different theories out yes. there. So but we're just giving you, I guess, one of them. And this is kind of what Matt and I lean towards. And yeah. we, could, we could be wrong. It's possible that we're wrong. Uh, as well, it's just not reasonable. I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's not reasonable that we're wrong. Yeah. But, late, but the stuff that we're going to deal with later on is is definitely got a little bit more behind it than just theory. Right. And so he's called a guardian cherub. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about cherubims, um, if you ever seen uh, a diagram of the Ark of the Covenant, and mm -hmm. if you watch Indiana Jones, yeah. the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you'll see it. One of my favorite movies. Me too. And so there's on the top of the mercy seat of the Ark, you have... Uh, cherubim angels that are covering the mercy seat with their wings. Yeah, and so people, some scholars think that that was symbolic for what the throne of God looked like in heaven. That there were uh, cherubim angels who covered God's glory uh, with uh, their wings. And so some people believe that Lucifer was one of those, uh, one of those angels. And that's a lot better theory, more reasonable than some of the other ones. Yeah, so he here. was he was a choir director. <laughs> There's nothing in there about it. When he, when I hear that, I, I think of. I think of uh, the uh, who, who's the guy that conducts the conductor know, of, a, yeah. of an orchestra like tap right. tap tap. Yeah, he's sitting there with Mickey with his wizard hat. Yeah, oh my goodness. <laughs> and so, um, so, so we know that Lucifer might have been one of these angels, and right. and so that he probably felt the power of worship coming through him into God's glory. That was something that it was something that he envied, and so and then, and then we find out that that Lucifer's is. Cast to the ground after this. Mm -hmm. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom 
uh, for the sake of your splendor, and I cast you to the ground. Some scholars believe that Lucifer felt, like I said, all that worship coming in through him, and he wanted to be worshipped himself. Uh, but he ended up being cast out of heaven. If And, it, and Isaiah kind of gives you a little bit of the same account. Yeah. He's another major prophet. Okay, Isaiah 14, starting in verse 13, says, You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will make myself like the Most High. Interesting. Right. It says, verse 12, Oh, how, oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. Or other translations will say, son of the morning. Mm -hmm. How you are cut down to the ground. Mm -hmm. And Jesus kind of makes reference to this in Luke 10, 18. It says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So we know that Satan was cast out. And you can even go to Revelation 9, verses 1, where it says, And I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. If you continue to chapter 12, verse 7, uh, it says, Now a war arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So not only was Lucifer cast out, yeah. but he caused a rebellion within the ranks of the angels, and so a whole group of angels were cast out with him. All right, so here's where we are so far. We've defined who Satan is. We defined kind of what he is. And that he had a judgment against him, he was cast out of heaven. Right, and he was, and, and, and if you go to uh, verse nine, this is what the last part of that verse says: He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So now yes. we have a, a group of angels that, by the way, you and I can't see, yeah, because they're. I, I feel like they're in a different dimension. They are. They, we, um, they're not. We can't see them. Right, and and I think even the apostle Paul felt that way too, because this is what he says in Colossians one sixteen. For by him all things were created. We know and he's are, talking about Jesus. Right. And that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And so throughout the Bible, um, this spiritual side, the spiritual dimension, yeah. uh, we like to call it spiritual warfare that's going on. Mm -hmm. there, you refer to as uh, thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. If we have an example of that. In the book of Daniel, and Daniel is a major prophet in the Old Testament. Well, Daniel 10 says in verse 12, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. It says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia has withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. All right, so so to put a little context to the story. Daniel is praying, and he needs an answer from God. And so God dispatches an angel, a messenger angel, to give Daniel the answer. Mm -hmm. But and he, by the way, he dispatched him on the same day that Daniel prayed. Yes. But the angel was with was withheld there twenty one days by the prince of Persia. Yeah. So we're talking about major, major spiritual warfare, and the archangel uh, Michael had to come and fight his way through there so that the messenger angel could get the message to Daniel. And then in verse 20, uh, Michael the archangel, is en he ends up talking to Daniel after fighting his way through the prince yeah. of Persia. And he says this, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come too. Right. These are not people. Right. <laughs> this, we're talking the prince about, of Persia and the prince of Greece. We're talking about strongholds. Yeah, these are demonic strongholds. And I, I believe that we still have those demonic Certainly. strongholds today. In fact... If you remember when we interviewed Jenny Miller, who was a missionary in China, she said she went to an area there and she started to pray and she saw a vision of a stronghold where she was. Yeah. And we can call it maybe it was the prince of the city of uh, where she was in China at the time. Certainly. And so a lot of these uh, dominions, principalities, they have uh, strong uh, strongholds, I should say, yeah. uh, within that area that uh, spiritually we really need to, to fight through. So we know that the devil... Satan and his army of angels are here on earth. We call them principalities and dominions. But uh, when when exactly do you think that they fell, man? Well, and that's really going to be the kind of the crux of the uh, of the rest of this lesson, and probably the strongest argument can be made with the scriptures themselves. So, um, so here's 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 really how it goes here. If you believe in a six day, we're going to come at this from a six day creation. Now, for more on that, we interviewed Jay Seeger, right. a creation. Uh, Expert. Yeah, a creation expert. <laughs> we had a six-part 
uh, lesson on that. So he talks about the uh, biblical basis for a six-day creation. So for more on that, please listen to that, that, to that podcast. We're going to come at it from that standpoint. So when were the angels and heavenly hosts created? Well, we know day one, everything was made. That means Because it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm-hmm. So before that, there was no time, there was no space, there was no matter. We're coming at this from a six-day literal creation. So the Garden of Eden was created on Day six. That's a big clue because we, we've already read that Satan was found in the Garden of Eden until iniquity was found in him. Mm-hmm. So the first date that's given in the Bible is in Genesis 4. Adam was 130 years old when he and Eve had their first two kids that they mentioned. So there is space for about 100 years of possible time in the Garden. Mm-hmm. Because you read Genesis 1 and 2, that's the creation Genesis 3 is not the next day. Right. We don't know exactly how much time went by, but there, it's possible that a lot of time went by, that, they were, that things were going very well in the garden. And, here, and here's really the problem. The common thought in Christianity is that God and the angels lived for millions of years together before God created man. And this is kind of where you get the idea of Satan being the choir director and all sure. that stuff. Yeah. But the problem is, is there's nothing in the scripture to support that. It does say that everything, and that includes the heavens and the angels, were created on day one, in the beginning. So here's what we need to realize. Eternity is infinite in both the future and the past. People say, well, what did God do for all that time before man? And here's the issue. No matter how far back you go, at some point the angels were created and you have the same problem. Mm -hmm. An infinite amount of time before the angels where God was alone. Unless you realize there was no time Mm -hmm. before day one. So everything was created, including the angels, on day one. The angels were created on day one, probably right before God created the earth. And that's where we get into the next uh, passage of Scripture in Job. Right. Now, we, when we read Scripture, sometimes, and we don't do it on purpose, but there's a, there's a feeling that we, we like to compress time. Yeah. Yeah. So like all of us were like, bang, bang, bang. We think that the, t- the time is going one day after the other. Yeah. And we don't realize, oh, there was a hundred years between verse 4 and verse 7. Yeah. And so we compress that time. And like you said, that there was uh, there was probably a hundred years that were possible in the garden yeah. uh, before that. So if we go to if we go to Job, listen, you know, Job is he's complaining to God about why he's going through what he's going through. And we know that he went through a lot of pain and suffering. And so and so he asked God, Why? Yeah. Why is this happening to me? And so God's like, You're gonna ask me. The creator of the universe, <laughs> why I'm allowing this to happen to you. And so then God's like, you know what? Before I give you an answer, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And if you can ask, <laughs> gird yourself up you like can, a man. And if you can answer <laughs> my questions, then yeah. I'll give you an answer for your question. Right. And I think he, gave, he asked like 99 questions something or something like, like that. that. And, and so in Job 38 verse 4, this is what God says. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Yeah. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, Job. Uh, or <laughs> who stretched out the line upon it? And then he continues. On what were the bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, what does that mean? Morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, we get a little bit of context in this chapter and also at the beginning of the book of Job. It talks about the sons of God gathered themselves to present themselves before the Lord. And it actually says Satan was there also to mm-hmm. present himself before the Lord. So the sons of God and the morning stars refer to angels in the book of Job. Mm-hmm. And Satan was once among that same heavenly host. But even though he was fallen, he still had to present himself and give an account as to what's going on. Right. And, and I, I have heard the theory, too, that when you go through the days of creation, on the day that God created the lights mm-hmm. in the firmament, you know, the, the stars yeah. in the sky, a lot of people will theorize that that's when, that's when the angels were created. It's possible. Because, yeah, it, it, yeah, like anything is possible. I'm not saying that that's objective truth. It had, it had to be created bef- by by day three. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So somewhere in there. I lean day one, but yeah, what you're saying is certainly a, that's a reasonable theory. Right. So we know why Lucifer fell. He, here's another reason why uh, Lucifer had to be good before man was created. He couldn't have already fallen. And he was already, it says uh, in Ezekiel, which we already read, that he was found in Eden until iniquity iniquity was found in him. How long was he in Eden before Mm, iniquity? Could have been some time there. 
Uh, so there was a time where he was there and had no iniquity. And God said at the end of chapter 1 of Genesis that everything he made was very good. How could he say the devil had already fallen and was bad? How could he say everything was very good if, yeah. if you've got an evil devil running around? He couldn't say that because Deuteronomy 32.4 says, Every work of God is perfect. So the heavens, Satan, and the angels were already originally very good. Right, until iniquity found him. Yes. Okay, and here's another, here's another clue in Isaiah 14. Look at the surroundings described in Isaiah 14. When it, says, when it mentions that he fell, it mentions a mountain. It mentions he will ascend to the clouds. It says he fell to the ground. It sounds like he fell to a created earth. Yeah. This wouldn't be before earth. Right. So, so there you have it. You have Satan found in chapter 3 of Genesis trying to uh, trick Eve to disobeying God. Well, he doesn't try. He actually does. He actually succeeds. <laughs> he succeeds and sin is ushered into the world. But And, and we know that uh, that he was created good. He was the signet of, of perfection mm-hmm. until iniquity was found in him. Uh, we can theorize that uh, he was one of the cherubim angels who covered God's glory with his wings, felt that worship coming in through him and maybe wanted to be worshipped just like God. And that's when the iniquity snuck in at that moment. He probably looked at man and said, you know, they ought to be worshipping me. That's probably right. And so then iniquity crept in him. He got a, he had a prideful heart. He wanted to ascend above all the other angels. He wanted to ascend above God himself. But we know that there's only one God. And so God ended up casting him uh, down to the ground. Michael and the archangels cast uh, Lucifer and his following of angels that rebelled to the ground. And because of that, we have dominions, thrones, principalities. We have a, a, a spiritual warfare, a battle for our souls that go on because of what happened. That's right. Then. So there you have it. That is the, uh, the skinny. The skinny on who Satan is and when he fell. Right. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.